Welcome to the 39th Annual State of the City Address and our first ever virtual event. My name is Drew Gray with the Stellar Family of Companies and the immediate past president of the Lubbock Apartment Association. The Lubbock Apartment Association is proud to host the State of the City Address. As an association, we represent and support owners, managers, and suppliers in the rental housing industry. We have over 500 members who manage over 30,000 apartments, single family homes, townhomes, and duplexes in Lubbock and the surrounding areas. Because we are an association, we are governed by a board of directors, and I would like to thank each and every board member for continuing to support this wonderful event. Many of you know the State of the City is a fundraiser that benefits a charity of the mayor's choice. For years, this event has been able to make donations in the mayor's name to organizations like Family Promise, Scottish Rite Learning Center, the South Plains Honor Flight, the Fire and Police Departments, and Literacy Lubbock. In the 38 years of this event, these donations, thanks to you and the board of directors, have totaled well over $250,000. As you watch today's presentation, please pay close attention to the sponsor names as they scroll across the screen. I would also like to give a special thanks to Title I for being our presenting sponsor. With these sponsors, we will be able to continue to make donations to the mayor's favorite charity each year. Now, I won't steal the mayor's thunder, and I will let him tell you more about this year's charity in just a bit. Now, please join me as we kick off the 39th Annual State of the City. Our invocation will be led by Todd Salswittle of First United Methodist Church, Pledge of Allegiance by Mayor Pro Tem Steve Massingale, and National Anthem will be sung by a group you won't soon forget, Blackwater Draw. Enjoy. Welcome to our virtual State of the City Address. My name is Reverend Todd Salswittle. I'm the senior pastor here at First United Methodist Church in Lubbock. We're blessed to have Mayor Pope and his wife as members who worship amongst us. Uh, but we also know that we're part of the broader community of Lubbock. And I want to thank you for joining us um, as we celebrate the amazing things that are going on in our city and we recognize our collective role together. As we begin, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads and pray with me today. Almighty and everlasting God, we come to you this day with gratitude in our hearts and a hope for our future. We thank you for the abundant blessings we experience each day, whether we take the time to consciously recognize them or not. Thank you for those gathered here today and for their concern for our community as well as our collective role in serving one another. And we thank you for those who you have placed among us that truly seek the benefit of others, even at cost or risk of self. Almighty God, we recognize, especially in a time like now, that we may be weary considering the enormous burden all of us have shouldered this past year. So we seek the energy and strength to see to fulfillment all that we have started and all that you have before us. Grant to those who are in positions of leadership the grace and wisdom to govern wisely, to act justly, and to allow love to guide their actions. Many of us gathered here come to you regularly seeking guidance, wisdom, and compassion. Today, assure us that you hear and respond to our prayers, though not always in a manner that we readily understand. We also confess that all too often, we allow other external factors and motives to drive us, allowing us at times to lose focus on the enormous opportunity each of us have, no matter our affiliation or background. We confess that it is easy for us to fall into the trap of being served rather than to serve. So this day, most gracious and loving God, may we conduct ourselves with dignity, respect, and a desire to understand one another above being understood ourselves. As we experience your presence with us today and celebrate our great city of Lubbock and the opportunities before us, we pray that your spirit of peace, community, goodwill and vision might wash over each person, especially in those most difficult and divisive of moments. We place our trust in you, Lord, confident that we have walked in your grace. 
And our hope is that in exemplifying the very best of who we are, we might honor one another and more importantly, honor you. We humbly offer these our prayers and our very selves to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you please join me in the pledges to the United States and the Texas flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Welcome to the 39th Annual Lubbock Apartment Association State of the City event. I want to thank the Lubbock Apartment Association and their business sponsors for hosting this year's event. Apartments and rental housing are an important part of Lubbock's economy and our quality of life. The Lubbock Apartment Association ensures professionalism, ethics, and quality customer service within this local industry. I appreciate all they do for Lubbock. Each year, the Lubbock Apartment Association generously donates a portion of the proceeds from the State of the City event to a charity of the Mayor's Choice. This year, I've chosen the Early Learning Centers of Lubbock as my designated charity. Early Learning Centers help children be better prepared for primary school, and they do much more than just help with the child's education. The Early Learning Centers of Lubbock provide the social, emotional, cognitive, and physical needs these young children need to learn to become productive adults. Thank you, Early Learning Centers of Lubbock, for making such an important difference in the lives of Lubbock children. And thank you, Apartment Association, for joining me in supporting Early Learning Centers of Lubbock. This is my fifth State of the City address. And I can tell you that today, I'm more excited about the future of Lubbock than ever before. 2020 was a year of great hardship. The COVID-19 pandemic affected families, businesses, schools, and our daily lives. We all empathize and hurt for lost lives, jobs, and businesses. From the hardship of 2020 rose the very best of Lubbock, perseverance, creativity, collaboration, grit, kindness, and ingenuity 
were in full bloom. We took care of our loved ones and our neighbors. We solved problems. We adjusted the way we lived life. Fall seven times, stand up eight, says the Japanese proverb. We stand together today, safe and resilient, charting the course for our bright future. Although we cannot share a meal together this year, I felt it important to include the community in this year's State of the City Address. So, like last year, this presentation will be a bit different. During this State of the City Address, you will see participants from all areas of our community, educators, nonprofit leaders, business people, parents, City of Lubbock leaders, volunteers, elected officials, and pastors. In these interviews, we will quickly discuss the highs and lows of 2020, and then look forward and share our hopes and goals for 2021. Then we will close with a quick Q&A session with the Lubbock Apartment Association 2021 President, Mike McClendon. What you will see this afternoon is just the highlight reel of the great discussions we had with Lubbock's community leaders. To watch the full length interviews or to view the City of Lubbock's 2020 data sets, please visit the Mayor's page on the City of Lubbock website. You can find the link below. I also want to thank everyone who volunteered their time to participate by sharing their perspective and insights. And finally, a big shout out to the city team for helping bring this all together. Finally, before we jump into the interviews, I will comment briefly on our current state of the city. Lubbock's economy is famous for its diversity and stability. It's, it is obvious this year that small business, education, agriculture, and healthcare are again, pillars of our community and our economy. Our unemployment rate was at 2.9% last February. At the peak of the pandemic, it spiked to nearly 11%. Today, we're at 5.2% and going down. More people are going back to work every day. Many of our college students went home from March to September and their absence drastically changed Lubbock's workforce and culture. However, in the fall, Texas Tech University hit their enrollment goal of 40,000 students by 2020. The compassion, innovation, and toughness that our healthcare providers displayed served not only Lubbock, but the trauma service area of 22 Texas counties and patients transferred here from New Mexico, Oklahoma, Colorado, and all over Texas. Our city COVID-19 vaccination clinic, a remarkable community effort leads the largest 20 counties in the state by vaccinating the highest percentage of eligible citizens. The challenges we faced have not overcome the people of Lubbock. My message in short, Lubbock prevails. We stand strong and together. My heartfelt appreciation for what you have endured and contributed over the past year. Thank you for caring about our city and for all you do to make Lubbock a better place to live, work, and play. It's a great day in Lubbock, Texas. Let's get on with the show. Jared, the COVID pandemic required the city to pivot, implement new strategies, redistribute resources, people, um, but also to provide the same level of services. Tell us a little bit about that response. What sticks out to you? I think the number one thing that sticks out to me is how flexible and how quickly city staff moved to do things that they hadn't, hadn't done before, hadn't asked them to do before because truly we had not needed for them to do that. Uh, the way we tried to handle that, um, first, we knew what those basic municipal services are that cannot suffer regardless. Things like your public safety your utility services, your water, your wastewater, your electricity, those things. And so those, to the extent we could, were not touched by the pandemic response. Now we create this entire new level of effort that's required by the pandemic. That was where we started to pivot. That's where you saw code enforcement officers working to purchase PPE, librarians serving as contact tracers, and the list truly goes on and on and on. 2020 
revenues. I, I want you to comment on that, but it looks like things were pretty much as expected. Uh, what does 21 look like um, also? So it's a little bit of flavor on both of those, if you would. Right, absolutely, Mayor. And you're correct. Uh, fortunately, the, the revenues did come in right on target. So, I mean, we, we did fare very well throughout this pandemic. We understand that this is uh, attributed to our economy as a whole, you know, on, on the sum, we did very well within our economy. Now, we understand that that wasn't across the board. We have to acknowledge the not only the, the businesses that were lost throughout the year, but also the lives that were lost. So Lubbock did have a, a, a hit to, to this pandemic. And as that came back to us, you know, fortunately, like I said, on the whole, we came out okay. In fact, we set records last year in, in permits pulled and houses uh, built. How do you how do you handle that and deal with pandemic and people working from home and not doing face to face? It had to be a challenge. Talk to me about that. Certainly, it was a challenge. In 2020, we issued 40% more single family permits than we did in 2019. Over 1,800 single family permits, in fact. Um, our staff was very quick to roll out online permitting so people could go online, apply for their permit, track the permit status, obtain their permit all virtually without having to set foot in City Hall. We also took a lot of our meetings that we traditionally hold in person and we moved them to a virtual platform. So we were able to continue our regular schedule and keep working as if, uh, as if nothing was happening despite COVID. You had to make some adjustments early on in 2020 because we can't do without natural gas. And so talk a little bit about the how you guys changed, what kind of sacrifices your employees made, your leaders made. I'm curious as to your perspective on that. In March of last year, um, about 95 percent of our 4,800 employees went home. Um, and started working remotely. And, you know, I say went home and, and that's not entirely true because many of the employees that all everybody sees out and about on a daily basis, um, you know, work out in the field. And so many of them work independently. So we, we changed the way they approach their work. We set up shifts for them to come into warehouses so that they didn't gather together. Our construction crews can't work by themselves, right? They, they work on crews. Um, but we, we put things into place, you know, obviously masks, right? And we, we tried to keep them as distant as they could when they were on job sites. We made sure they all had separate vehicles to drive to job sites um, to keep them separate. We put in place things like um, clean it, use it, clean it, right? When they're sharing tools, just basic, really simple things like that. James, uh, you, uh, as in your role as a banker, uh, you, you deal with a lot of small and medium-sized businesses. In fact, most Lubbock businesses are small and medium-sized, classically defined um, how would you, um, how, how do they stand today? From a community bank standpoint, we, what we've tried to do is uh, make sure that we're taking care of our clients as, as, as best as possible, whether it's, you know, through these, uh, these business loans or, uh, you know, deferments on, on, on payments or any, any of those, those items that we can do from a financial sector, because that's the last thing that, that we want them to worry about. Uh, and that's the last thing that they're they're worried about. You know, their <clears throat> their main concern is uh, operational. You know, how do we how do we continue to uh, open these doors uh, day in and day out? Um, and so that's the last thing banking is is the last thing we want them to uh, be concerned with. And so to the point of your your question, I, I you know I'm cautiously optimistic uh, because Lubbock, as you know, is somewhat of a bubble. Um, you know. The challenges that we see nationally are, are somewhat uh, different than what we've what we see here. You know, from a, a community bank standpoint, we're going to do everything that we can and, and provide the assistance that uh, many many banks or many uh, small businesses need. And and we've certainly tried to do that um, again through the uh, Paycheck Protection Program and the Main Street Loan uh, Program as well. Why Lubbock, Texas? Uh, why invest in Lubbock? Uh, that's my first question. And then how's it been? You're now, what, 90 days in. So tell us how, how things are going. And really, let me say how happy and excited we continue to be at HEB to be in Lubbock, how honored we are to be part of this community, and really how humbled we are at the response that the community has given to our first store. And I think why, to get to why Lubbock, you know, like any other consumer-facing businesses, we look at a lot of different factors. The first has to be that there's a demand for, for the product that we have. Um, strong population and economic growth, strong workforce availability and quality, 
uh, and then obviously real estate availability. And with these factors in mind, and, and you and I have spoken quite a bit, opening a store in Lubbock was a natural fit. Lubbock's nonprofit organizations were really impacted by the pandemic. One of the first things that happened was the South Plains Response Fund. Talk to me about that and your role in that and how, how you saw that um, in 2020. We had already began to network with other uh, private foundations and, and looked at what might be um, the appropriate response. But the one that, the thing that came through so quickly was that we needed to be, we needed a pool of resources, we needed to be nimble and ready to move, and we needed a process by which to determine which were the highest needs that we had at the time. Because at the time, I mean, it, it was really shifting. At first, we thought it was going to be childcare and what were the schools going to do and then how did we fill in there and then it was feeding and it was how to take care so we really didn't know and, and you didn't want to be too far out in front of it because there were a lot of other resources that were coming down and we knew we needed to be able to maximize the use of every single resource we could bring to the table tell us about what the year was like for your partners your partner agencies and then talk a little bit about your campaign because it was certainly different too Immediately, we started shifting things. And then the, the COVID relief fund, that $1.6 million that was contributed and went out within about 90 days or so, was really important to our agencies and a lot of others. But just the sheer demand for services went through the roof, as you can imagine, especially for rent, and utility assistance and all other kinds of things, food and um, counseling and childcare. And because families were displaced and then we launched the annual campaign for the fall of the year. We backed off of our goal a little bit from the previous year uh, and set a goal at 5.7 million. We ended up having 5.4 million contributed many ways I've had some, some folks comment that in many ways, this might have been the best campaign we ever had because the community came together to really support the nonprofits. How would you describe the, the, the community and regional effort to, to feed people? Well, there's been a 200% increase in Texas needing food assistance. And here locally, we've seen our food bank have a 70% increase. So what that means is we have had to really step up and feed more people than ever before. And we simply couldn't do it without living in such a wonderful community in which we really do have a long tradition of neighbor helping neighbor. One of the things that we saw in, in the biggest challenges we faced was probably the children not being in school and they had no access to their free or reduced lunches and to food. And so we then had to really become innovative, step up, and make sure that these children were going to be getting their food. As you reflect back on it, what, what's the story? How would you describe 2020 from your perspective? For 2020 for us, especially at Covenant Health System, was around adaptation. Uh, every day we came into work, it seemed like there was a new model by the CDC. It seemed like, you know, the panels were changing, how we were going to do testing, what PPE was needed, how much PPE was needing was constantly evolving. And we had to be on our toes. So we had to adapt every day. We had to make sure that our caregivers were taken care of and that they had the proper precautions uh, that they had on the floor, make sure that they had all the equipment they really needed. Uh, we had to rework our entire hospital. I mean, you think we put in 123 negative pressure rooms just inside of our hospital to make sure that we could get patients taken care of and make sure that our caregivers are safe, you know, as they walked into the rooms. The other biggest thing for me was resilience. Uh, I am amazed at the resilience of our healthcare workers. I don't mean this in a trite way. This really is a battle. It's a battle that we've been waging for several months now. And the work is, um, it's very intense. If you, if you just watch it from a distance, um, it's quite intense. Um, the weariness uh, that builds and grows, uh, what they call burnout, the, we the weariness is, is pretty uh, severe at times. And yet, at the end of the day, um, 
Our staff come back every single day. They're very tenacious. They have a strong calling for what they're doing. They have a strong calling to um, protect and, and advocate and treat patients. And so, honestly, at the end of the day, it's an amazing thing to witness. I'm very grateful to each one of them. When I think about the last 10 months, we've gone from uh, a drive-up trailer to a medical tent to a vaccine clinic, and each one was set up in five, six, seven days. And so what the words I might not have used as readily last year or in 2019, words like innovation and um, nimbleness, being nimble, um, rapid decision-making, rapid fighter decision-making, those have been part and parcel of our daily life, you know, for some time. The pandemic uh, pretty much called it, you know, called the question, so to speak. Uh, talk a little bit about that and how it's changed your, the way you guys deliver healthcare. We really turned to what we had already established, foundations in telehealth, how we were able to pivot within seven days. Uh, we went from four uh, visits a week to 20 to 25. And then the next thing we knew, we were doing three, 400 telehealth visits a week across a very diverse area, telehealth and uh, ICU, telehealth and family care, telehealth and chronic medicine and dermatology, particularly in mental health. So that happened very quickly. In our research realm, we, we pivoted quickly and suddenly we were doing using Zoom for key uh, stakeholder meetings around research and really building a new paradigm of how we conducted research and brought researchers into the building. And then of course, academically, uh, we were able to continue to, to get all of our folks through their academic preparation. We did not have any students who had delayed graduation or delayed preparation with their theses and dissertation. And because we knew that we had a mission to get healthcare workers out in the field doing what they needed to do to, do to provide care. One of our big challenges is maintaining over 1,300 miles of, of city streets. Tell me what we did last year and what are our plans to continue to meet that growth? Last year, we spent $10 million cash funded for street maintenance on those 1,300 miles. We also started a program a couple of years ago that I believe we will continue and elevate, and that is we're going to be able to fund uh, better in doing unpaved dirt roads that we have all across the city. It hasn't really been addressed. We've been doing a little bit between 400 and 800,000 a year. That initiative will continue in the future. And we look forward to continuing that program. So many of us have not been to the airport because of the change in our lives. It's affected your business, but the show's gone on. We've continued to invest in our airport because it's so important to us. Where are we and what should we expect in 21? Well, you know, as most people know, the building opened in 1976. And so uh, last year, pre-pandemic, we got started on about a $45 million project to really completely renovate the terminal building. And uh, that has continued throughout the pandemic. And uh, strangely, probably been one of the blessings that we've been able to have less inconvenience to our passengers and our, our partners in the building. But uh, it's a complete overhaul from uh, basic infrastructure, replacing the roof and the PA system and the flooring and the plumbing and HVAC. Um, to adding some safety components out in front, enhanced crosswalks, and um, to and, you know all of that gave us the opportunity to give it a, a facelift. And when people do resume flying, they're going to be uh, surprised, and I think pleasantly surprised to see what a coat of paint and new floors can do because it looks like a new place. Judge Parrish, for more than 20 years, the city of Lubbock and Lubbock County have led the way with the Ports to Plains initiative. You guys made a lot of progress in 2020, um, even you know against the wind and the pandemic. Talk a little bit about where we are with that and what we should expect going forward. Well, of course, the, the major thing was this legislative direction uh, to, to do a, a, a full study of the corridor. And of course, under your direction, Mr. Mayor, we brought together the mayors and the county judges from the Rio Grande Valley all the way up to the Panhandle. 
in studying this entire Ports to Plains corridor to, to find out exactly what we need, what it needs to look like, a timeline to, to put all this together. That presentation will be uh, was given to the governor uh, just this past fall. Uh, that will be distributed to all the members of the Texas legislature as well. And of course, like anything, you know, the, the next step is funding. Uh, we know that this is a very large dollar project uh, in, in making sure that we can move all of the food and the fiber and the fuel from South Texas and West Texas, move that out to the rest of the world. Chief Fogerson, the pandemic uh, changed the way first responders um, went about their business. Talk, talk a little bit about that and what you guys learned from that. We knew we had to start preparing now, start changing our policies and procedures just to reassure everyone that we were going to be prepared. But, but we had to let our, our troops know that, yes, this is coming uh, and, and we need to be ready for it. There was a, a shortage of PPE, so there for a while, and, and it wasn't a problem with our vendors, it was a problem of availability. The vendors couldn't even get it. So we couldn't get it through our normal channels. We began to make our own PPE. Um, there were several vendors and, and companies and organizations throughout Lubbock that, that began to make us face shields. Um, we made our own aprons, our own uh, gowns to protect ourselves. And, and we did it out of Tyvex house wrap. We would buy it in you know 500 foot rolls and, and stamp our own gowns out of there. So we had to get really creative. How did you guys swing into action? And how did you continue through the year to, to, to shift and to add? And because you, you, you made a bunch of changes through the year. Yeah, and I think the best thing that prepared us first was our health department staff on their own actually went out for a certification called Public Health Ready, which is a national certification. We completed that in October. Um, that certification has us review our plans, such as setting up a pod site, how to do large, um, lots of contact tracing. Um, so we October of 19? October of 19. Okay, right before. Okay, and so we actually sure. got the award in January, right, right as we were ramping up um, the planning for COVID-19. And, um, you know, we started talking about that in January of 2020. We were having staff meetings, going through the what ifs. If this gets to Lubbock, what would we do? How would we handle our first case? Um, and then from there, we started realizing that this really was coming, um, starting looking at, well, just doing one case investigation is not going to be enough. How do we do 100? How do we do 1,000 case investigations? What kind of measures, what kind of education needs to go out to the community? And it's just being fluid and being able to change um, and pay attention to what's going around nationally and what's needed for our community to control the spread of the virus. Chief Mitchell, there's a lot going on in your world. There, there is a lot going on. And, um, you know, just being over here in Lubbock uh, for just over a year, one of the things that I, I did when I first came in is really try to learn a little bit about the history of Lubbock and its police department. Uh, and in reading up on some of the history of Lubbock Police Department, you know, it was obvious to me that, hey, guys, this is our 100th year anniversary is coming up. And everyone was like, what? I said, you guys don't celebrate your anniversaries like your 25, 50th, 70th? It's like, well, no, we've never done that in the past. And it was something that I was used to doing in my previous uh, department. I was like, this is huge. This is 100 years of being a police department and having a, a police, a chief police, you know, uh, uh, designated by the commission at that point in time. So I wanted to really start talking about what that was going to look like and how we were going to celebrate it. Uh, and I, I don't have my badge on now, but we have a 100th anniversary badge that uh, all the officers get to wear for this year. Uh, and then at the end of the year, you have to retire it and go back to our, our traditional badge. Uh, our, our media relations uh, department is going to have several different things throughout the year to celebrate our 100th year anniversary. And it coincides with the opening of three of our patrol division stations. I think change happens only with trust as the, as the foundation. Um, we've worked hard in, in building relationships you know, through our community engagement task force and, and certainly other ways, but are we making progress in building trust in our community? I think we're making baby steps yeah. because building trust is not just showing up when there's fanfare. That's right. Trust is, is, is created when you engage at all times. 
every opportunity that you get, and we make sure that we create those opportunities to engage with individuals, let them, let them see our heart so that they'll realize that what we're doing is because we want to and we feel the need to. You can't be what you don't see. Yeah, talk about that a little bit. I, I think it's important for us to uh, have the opportunity to engage people that do things that, that we may aspire to, or we don't know that we aspire to do, but they can help us come to that realization. If someone's not able to see someone uh, modeling that, they don't know that they can do that as well. But I think if, if we in, in, in want, want uh, young people to be, to grow up to be the chief of police, doggone it, we better show them one right. that looks like them. If we want someone to be an educator, they should have the, the ability or the opportunity, I'll say it like that, to see one, to see one live, to see one move throughout the community. Because living is more than being in a, in a structure. It's the place where you grow, it's the place where you give, where you, uh, you, you expend your energy. I'm, I'm very happy to say that the mayor, along with uh, council persons, Sheila Patterson Harris and Juan Chavez, uh, got together and reorganized the council uh, or, or reorganized the task force. And they selected me to serve as the very first chair of uh, that task force. Uh, part of the goals that I have for the task force is really to uh, evaluate where we are as a city and, and talk about and, and research the, the inequality and the racial uh, inequity that, that, that might be a part of the city. Just find out where we are and then make uh, and suggest and make adjustments uh, to uh, our city to make our city uh, the, the wonderful and the, the, a better place. And I, I believe that uh, we do that by uh, research. There are certain cities that are doing this, this kind of work already. And we take a look at their, at, at their research. And then we, we devise our own plan and make it our own. Uh, I think Lubbock is a wonderful place to live, and, but I think it can be a lot better when everybody has a, a fair and equitable chance to progress and, and move forward. I'd like you to describe your thoughts about 2021. <laughs> en nuestro futuro para el 2021. Que seamos siguiendo una comunidad unida, una comunidad fuerte, y todos de mano en mano, apoyándonos uno al otro. No andar con que eh, yo no, yo no puedo, yo no quiero, apuntándole con el dedo a otra persona. Si miras una injusticia, tienes que responder por esa injusticia. Ayudarle a tu próximo, ayudarle a tu hermano o a tu hermana, en, en el nombre de Cristo. Tenemos que hacer eso. And in English, let's not sit back with our arms crossed and have the it's not my problem attitude. If you see an injustice, if you see a wrong, it's our, it, it's our duty, it's our job, it, it, it's... To, to, to help our, 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 our citizens. If you see an injustice, stand up and say something about it. Maybe even make the phone call, make that emergency or non emergency phone call and say, hey, there's a problem here. That way we won't read about it in the newspaper tomorrow or a few days later. There's an injustice, it's, it's, it's our problem when there's an injustice. But then we become the problem if we don't react to that injustice. We need to do this as a community. And I've always said the word in community is at the end of it, it says unity, together. We've got to do it together. What does Buddy Holly Hall mean to Ballet Lubbock? Buddy Holly Hall and Ballet Lubbock is, I mean, quite simply, just the beginning of a new era for, mm -hmm. for Ballet Lubbock. Uh, in simple terms, it doubles our square footage, but the enhancement of the quality of that space is tenfold. But I think more importantly, it, Buddy Holly Hall allows Bella Lubbock to realize its full potential, the full potential of our relationships with our community partners, our community engagement initiatives. And I think what's most exciting is putting Ballet Lubbock in proximity to Charles Adams Studio Project, to Luca, to the Symphony, to, you know, restaurant and a world-class facility, world-class stage in all the ways Buddy Holly Hall is the stage.
for great things to come. As we start to ramp up this year, what kind of programming do, can we expect uh, at Buddy Holly Hall? Well, to be able to bring um, this type of facility to Lubbock in 2021, it's just a bright spot of hope, I think, for the citizens of our community. And it's just a magical, a magical place to be uh, when you walk in the doors. And you'll see everything from events hosted by our partners, Lubbock ISD, Ballet Lubbock, spectacular shows from the Lubbock Symphony Orchestra, uh, comedians, concerts, all kinds of things lined up for the spring and summer. And then we really get rolling with the national touring productions in the fall of 2021. We'll have Broadway shows, we'll have um, big, big entertainments and big acts already on the books for the fall. So it's just so exciting, the things that we'll be able to bring to the community. Councilwoman Joy, during the middle of the pandemic last year, we opened or reopened the Burl Huffman uh, complex, uh, athletic complex. You, uh, you were a driving force behind that. Uh, what, what does that mean to our kids? But maybe more importantly, what does it mean to the region? What does it mean to business in our community? We live about 120 miles from Amarillo, from Midland, from Odessa, from Clovis, and from Hobbs, New Mexico, and it's 140 miles to Abilene. All of those cities have soccer kids who want to play, and they all want to come to Lubbock to do that. So for the economy, it means bringing people in, they go to our restaurants, they shop in our stores, and they spend their nights with us. And so it's exciting for our kids to have that facility here and for them to have the opportunity to have the big tournaments that we've not been able to have. Dan, May 11, 2020 was the 50th observance of the Lubbock tornado. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we were unable to open the new tornado memorial. Catch us up. What's going on? Where are we with that great project? We've been working diligently with Lee Lewis. We have a great group of, of Lubbock citizens that have worked uh, very tirelessly to make this project come together. Um, and uh, a lot of setbacks with COVID. They are committed to making this happen by the 51st anniversary um, in May this year. So we've, uh, uh, they're doing a lot of the on-site engraving right now, uh, which is really neat to see come together. And I think this project is gonna be a beautiful place for Lubbock citizens to come and remember the people that lost their lives and, uh, and then celebrate the fact that Lubbock came back just like we'll come back from COVID. Robert, there are a lot of great things going on in downtown Lubbock. When you speak of 13th Street, of course, first thing that comes to mind, you've got the new city hall. Well, what did that do? Well, you can look at it and tell what it did, and it's, it's, it's much more functional, beautiful building, but it also created a double win. The old city hall, uh, purchased by South Plain College, now under renovation, uh, and soon we'll have 2,000 to 2,500 students. Now, what does that mean to downtown Lubbock? Well, that's automatic activity. But aside from that, you've got, you've got faculty, and you got a support staff, uh, they all ser start searching for some place to live close to work. And once again, there's a, there's a demand for living in downtown Lubbock anyway. Uh, but you put all that on top of it, and there's a lot of projects that you'll see we'll make now uh, for heads and beds. But you go on down 13th Street and Civic Park, and this all ties together because urban living is unique and it's something probably we're not used to in Lubbock, but you see it in other cities. And there's a lot of people really like urban living. From an administrator's point of view, what's that been like and how, how does it change your, your leadership role? Throughout this pandemic, whether the teachers are teaching virtually face-to-face -face, or a combination of both, um, they have been extremely creative and innovative in the ways that they've used technology to enhance instruction. Um, I believe that is definitely going to be a COVID keep. When this is all said and done, I believe many of these tools that we've learned to use during this time are things that we'll continue to use. Um, I also believe this pandemic has really highlighted 
how crucial our wraparound services are for students to be successful in school. Um, and then just the social, emotional learning supports that our students need, our counselors, our social workers, um, our community partners, such as communities and schools, have played such a crucial role in helping us to keep our students on track and keeping them successful during this time. What are your observations about teachers and how they've had to pivot and change and, and um embrace a new world? Gosh, I, I really just feel like it's a, a privilege to even get to speak on their behalf. Teachers have never just been about um, academics. Um, they're about the relationships. Our teachers stood up. They stood in the gap. And we've got teachers around this state and around the country that still haven't come back. And all of us knew that there were risks. We tried to mitigate every possible risk, just like healthcare workers, grocery store cashiers, all of those, but they stood up and they, they came back and they are teaching our kids. And we're doing something here in West Texas that some people across the strait and across the United States still haven't done. What's the parents' perspective on all of this? And then how have you safely um, managed uh, to allow the extracurriculars to happen? It's such a big part of, of the way um, our kids uh, interact. We turned the learning model upside down from what all of us have ever been trained and ever experienced. And when we did that, uh, parents became the teacher uh, in a lot of areas, or at least the facilitator. And whether it was online or with packets or what have you, it was, it was a role parents hadn't played before. So then there was frustration with it. And then there was excitement. And toward the end of the spring last year, there was just a realization by parents, uh, as, as Dr. McCord said, of how so very important our teachers are. I think uh, what, what we've done in our district and, and other soups have done as well in theirs is find a way to say yes. Find a way to provide some normalcy for kids. And for many, many kids, extracurriculars, be it sports, fine arts, theater, any ag, whatever it is, that is the, the latch that keeps them engaged in the school community. Dr. Skuvnik, uh, Texas Tech's enrollment has grown during COVID-19. Why is that? To the point that my colleagues have already mentioned, we made a concerted effort to provide more of the traditional elements of the college experience. I saw a report this week that listed Texas Tech among the 16% of universities in this nation that offered more face-to-face -face than any other modality. And I believe that's what parents and students wanted. We also really did ramp up our communication and marketing through print and electronic media. It's a very competitive world. We have to sell the great product that we have. But what really helps us is once those parents and students get to Lubbock, Lubbock sells itself. Jared, Citizens Tower opened for business around mid-year 2020. Tell us about Citizens Tower, the transition from the old city hall, and what are the benefits of consolidating municipal operations? That was an excellent question, and uh, I'm probably going to answer that in reverse order. Okay. The biggest benefit that we see from Citizens Tower is how much easier it is now for our customers to come and to work with us. So Citizens Tower all in is a 188,000 square foot facility. We have roughly 450 people who work here throughout the day, but that represents employees that previously were in four different locations. And they're all now here, they're all available. We have put the majority of our uh, customer service operations on the first floor, the one-stop shop. I think it's been a great benefit both for us and the community. Talk about plans for a, what will become a city complex downtown. And then maybe also touch on our, some of our community policing investments. Initially, I, I would call your attention to the parking garage. It started in October, and you can see it under construction today. It's going to be able to serve our citizens and our staff for many years to come. Next, you'll see our municipal court. It actually started construction the first week of February, and, and that will serve the needs of our municipal court and those that have to visit municipal court. Next is our police headquarters, which 
is directly south of our parking garage and a block south of the tower, and it'll begin construction in April of this year. As far as community policing, our substations are well underway. They've been under construction for the past year, and we'll start moving into them later in the year. The east substation probably around June, the south substation probably September, and we look forward to moving into the north substation about November. What did we learn from 2020? I think one of the biggest things we learned is just how small our world really is. If we didn't see it before, I think Lubbock sees now how important our universities, our small businesses, and visitors are to our local economy. I think we learned how to adapt our processes and procedures to not just survive, but to, in some cases, achieve even better results. I think we learned that we need each other, and while we can meet on a video call, we far prefer to meet in person. And while I know there are many who have been directly affected by this pandemic, either in sickness or by loss of loved one, job or business, I believe we learned that we are far more resilient than we ever believed. When I think about 2021, I do think about the, as trite as it may sound, the best is yet to come for Lubbock, Texas. But what differentiates Lubbock, Texas is the phenomenal people that are here and the can-do spirit that personifies West Texas. So when I think about 2021, the one word that comes to mind is anticipation. I anticipate great things for Lubbock, Texas. So 2021, I believe, will be uh, certainly a year of uh, transition. Uh, because of 2020, I don't believe we will ever go back to the way things were uh, in, my, in our church life, uh, in the way that we do business, um, we just have to take a look and, and, and make some needed change. Uh, I, I believe that 2021 can be a year of, uh, of progress. I believe that 2021 uh, will be a year of reflection and adjustment. And so uh, I think 2021 will be a, a, a prosperous year. I really do. What did I learn last year? I learned what I already knew and believe. Lucky me, I live in Lubbock. I hope you feel lucky too. What's over the horizon for Lubbock is what those who came before us saw and what most all of us see every day. A place that shouts freedom, self-reliance, a love of God and country, and a strong vision of not what is, but what can be. So what's my word to describe 2021? Positivity. Resistance. We are strong, strong in the city. I'm gonna say resiliency. Growth. My two words for 2021 are optimism and then together. Unity in our community and we can do it. We are doing it. Excitement of what's to come. It's the year we go. Everything's really set to go. And if we don't go in 21, we might miss it. 2021 is hope. Hope. It's really just hope. It would just be hope. Innovation. Renewal. Revolutionary. Gratitude. I'll, I'll go with tenacious. Progressive. Recovery. Regrouping. We needed each other to make this thing work. If it's gonna happen, we've gotta work together to make it happen. I think people realize what Lubbock means to them and how great a place it is to live. Expect it. It's that excited feeling that something is about to happen, especially something good and interesting. There's so much anticipation and eagerness about this upcoming year. What challenges and opportunities will it bring? When will things be back to quote unquote normal? What great things will happen to us, our friends, our businesses, our community? We know good things are about to come to us and we can't wait for it to happen. We're expectant. So we've gotten to the point that every, in this program that everybody's been waiting for, the Q&A session. I'm joined by Mike McClendon, the brand new president of the uh, Lubbock Apartment Association. Mott is also an attorney and a real estate investor, downtown advocate. The floor is yours. Take it away, Mott. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Just a few questions. I want to start with the economy. Okay. Historically, Lubbock's economy has been very stable. Um, can you talk about how Lubbock's economy performed in 2020? Well, I think 2020 was uh, a mixed bag, but overall I would um, say it was positive, more positive than negative. Sales tax uh, actually exceeded our budget last year. Um, housing starts were at an all-time high. I've heard comments about that already today. Uh, and unemployment went from 2.9 in February to nearly 11 
back to close to 5% as we sit here today. People are going to work every day. I think in general, we're in a pretty good spot. I want to talk about uh, LPNL joining ERCOT. As we know, that in integration date is set for this year, and ERCOT represents about 90% of the capacity and function of our state. Uh, what does LPNL joining ERCOT mean for our city? You're right, ERCOT serves 26 million Texans today. Um, in 2015, the Lubbock City Council, um, after studying it for 18 months, decided to move towards joining ERCOT. Um, so we're five and a half years into that process and are slated to connect this summer. We believe that ERCOT offers less expensive power, um, it's safe, uh, there's quite a bit of choice involved once we opt into retail choice so people can choose their provider. Um, and, and generally, it's been reliable. However, we saw um, with the uh, you know, record winter storm several weeks ago, we saw some real serious reliability issues. And we're working hard to make certain that those uh, changes are in place as we uh, you know, finish that transition. The, the question that was forefront in, in any conversation regarding Lubbock and ERCOT is whether or not Lubbock has an opportunity in this moment um, to be a part of the conversation about the changes that I think ERCOT is, is looking towards. I think we do have a seat at the table for this. What we've seen early on is, is much more of a uh, diving into what happened and a lot of conversation with ERCOT and the Public Utility Commission. I believe that begins to shift. We're starting to see that shift. And I think it's how do we fix it? And I think we're a big stakeholder when it comes to, to that discussion. Lubbock's load, electric load, would be the largest load to join ERCOT since deregulation in the late 90s. The City Council created a Future Needs Committee. Um, what is the status of that committee's efforts? Yeah, so after our planning meeting last November, we appointed a three-member committee to work on future uh, capital needs. So led by Councilman Griffith, it includes Ms. Joy and Ms. Patterson-Harris. They, they made recommendations regarding uh, Fire Station 20, they read recommendations around uh, paving dirt streets, and then they really dug in deep on our streets needs. I think the things that citizens would be interested in knowing. Uh, they made a recommendations that, recommendation that we make a big step forward on paving dirt streets. Um, we're doing about you know, somewhere between five hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars a year worth of those right now. We've been doing those the last four years. They suggested that we make a commitment to do about nine million worth of those streets and spread it out over several years. It'll take several years to do that. Remember, these are streets that have never been paved. Yeah, I think the council's pretty thinks that's a pretty important topic. They, in their recommendations, they recommended that we finish Thirty Fourth Street, so Quaker to Slide. Avenue Q to the interstate, and then eventually over to Avenue A. They uh, they suggested that we take care of 114th Street. So basically from Frankfurt to the east, all the way to the east city limit. There's some discussion about Broadway still. It was not in their initial recommendation, but I think the, some of the council feels like we should look deep uh, longer at that. The Civic Center was discussed in our November planning meeting. Uh, it did not come back to us from the committee, uh, but certainly that remains alive. We've not made a decision yet. Written in 1917 is effectively the city's constitution. Um, the city council has charged a citizens committee with reviewing that charter and developing recommendations to help the, the city update its charter. But can you tell us about the, the city's charter efforts? Thanks for asking. I want to make sure we talk about this. That charter needs modernization. I believe the council all agrees on that. It needs to be cleaned up. There are some more specific kind of questions that will be debated and they will come back to us with some answers. It's a seven member committee. We appointed them at our February 23rd meeting. Uh, they're to report back their findings to us by our first meeting in June. I think the, the likely next step would be the council would look at it um, make any adjustments to the plan and uh, put it to the voters 
uh, in, in November. So I want to talk about downtown. Uh, it's it's notable notable that changes have been happening in downtown Lubbock over the past few years. Talk about the importance of Lubbock having a, a vibrant downtown, as well as some of the projects on the horizon relative to downtown. I love to talk about downtown. You and I have been stakeholders downtown a long time. We live, we work here, we play here, we come to eat here, we go to church down here, volunteer down here. It's just it's it's important. I, I think downtown is the the heartbeat of a community. It's the uh, sort of the, the den or the family room of a community. You don't find a community that's growing um, over a quarter of a million people in our country that hasn't addressed their downtown, that doesn't have a, a vibrant downtown. Just think about the last what's happened in the last year downtown. Uh, Buddy Holly Hall opened, uh, the, uh, the Cotton Court Hotel opened, the, the building we're in, Citizens Tower, renovation of a 1960s bank building to to take uh, to hold our city operations was completed. Work has begun on uh, retrofitting the old city hall for South Plains College's downtown Lubbock Center. Um, you've got work going on to build apartments at uh, Metro Tower, the old NTS building. In fact, if you want an apartment, if you want to live downtown today, there's not a, an apartment available. There's demand for that. We adopted the downtown master plan last year, and, and it takes a lot of these projects into uh, consideration, but also charts what the next you know, 10, 12, 15 years should look like. It, would, it, it uh, really brought to light this idea about needing green space downtown, a big meeting space. And so we've hired a, a firm to, to help us design and, and uh, conceptually come up with a plan for a a civic park right in the heart of, of downtown. You know, there's pl new places to eat and new brew pubs opening up. I could go on and on, but I would just simply say that after lots and lots of work, we can finally say the wind is at our back. There's great days ahead for downtown Lubbock. So what did you learn from 2020? I learned a lot about the, uh, the soul of Lubbock about the, the West Texas spirit. I also learned how, how remarkable our healthcare is. We bragged on it. We, you know, we talk about it and brag on it, but um, I, I learned um, how really, really good we are. I learned how this community is selfless in so many ways. The collaboration's been remarkable between Texas Tech, between our large employers, between healthcare, between our school districts, between our business community. Um, we wouldn't be where we were are today if we weren't all pulling in the same direction. Um, I've said it a bunch of times, but there's no place that I'd rather be than Lubbock, Texas. What do you see on the horizon for 2021? As I think about 2021, I wanna talk about our economy first, and then I wanna talk about Lubbock in general. We're on the right track. Our economy is, is coming back. We gotta get people back to work. That's job one, I think, creating an environment where those people can get back to those jobs. That helps, as we talked about earlier, that connects everything. I think post-pandemic, Lubbock, uh, Lubbock is a winner. People want backyards. They want an affordable cost of living. They want a place where their kids can safely play in the street. I think people are yearning a bit for more of a value system that to us is uh, something we cling to. Some people might call it old fashioned. We just call it the Lubbock way of life. We've invested in, infra in infrastructure. You know, streets and, and highways, a water system. I mean, we went through that winter storm last month. We don't talk about it much with no blips in our water system. Um, we're poised to grow. The Lubbock story is one that's becoming more familiar. We're on the radar screen from, from people that are outside of Lubbock wanting to get part of the action, as well as people that are here today that want to make more investments, more significant investments. I'm really, really excited about 2021 for Lubbock. I, I, uh, um, I think our best days are ahead of us. And um, 
I look forward to getting to do this again next year and talking about what I think is going to be a uh, remarkable year for our community. Thank you for joining this year's State of the City presentation. And thank you again to the Lubbock Apartment Association for hosting today's event. In the last hour, we heard from a number of Lubbock residents who shared a great deal of information. We learned how working together helped us get through the hardships of the past year. Many of you know how much I believe in the American dream. That's the idea that every girl or boy in our country can get a good education, work hard, and achieve their goals. The American dream is alive and well in Lubbock, Texas. It's no secret that Lubbock's a great place to raise a family, a good place to work, and a great place to enjoy life. New residents and new businesses come to Lubbock because of these qualities. They like the pace at which we live. They share our value system. Our local businesses who have deep roots in Lubbock are expanding their operations and investing in our community. The vaccination clinic at the Civic Center embodies Lubbock's spirit and innovation. Remarkable teamwork is on display every day. It drips with hope and caring. Better days, better days are in our very near future. Please don't forget what differentiates us. Lubbockites are resourceful and smart. We work hard. We like to have fun. And we fiercely love and take care of our own. It's my great honor to serve as your mayor. Our very best days are in front of us. It's a great day in Lubbock, Texas. Thank you.